Hey everyone, this is Steph Strickland, one of your hosts for EAA Spirit of Aviation Week content as part of our broader EAA Together initiative. And as a student pilot, I am really excited about this next panel. Let's go ahead and bring them up on screen so I can introduce you to them right now. We have Jason Miller from the Finer Points CFI. We've got Josh Hello. Flowers, Aviation 101. Hi. And Chris Palmer, Angle of Attack, all here giving us their wealth of knowledge in the arena of flight instruction and beyond. But Chris, I would be remiss if I didn't start by asking you about the earthquake uh, last night, given that you are up in Alaska. What happened, buddy? It was far away, but it was in the ocean. So we got a tsunami warning and uh, living so close to the ocean, we had to evacuate last night. So everyone's good. Uh, we're a little tired today because it happened in the middle of the night, but we're all safe. So yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for checking on us. Absolutely. I know that uh, you're you're a little bit tired and we just we appreciate your time in all of this. I have a lot of questions that yep. I want to get to, uh, but I'll let you know as well. We do have the chat feature open on YouTube. So please, by all means, get your questions in. I will pass along as many of them as I can live and in real time. And we actually have a really good one that's coming in from George Milstead. Uh, and George wants to know how COVID-19 and the coronavirus is affecting your instruction and or flying. So let's go ahead, Jason, and start with you. Um, well, you know, I mean, back here, I'm at the San Carlos Flight Center today, which is where I do most of my flying, and they're, they're in full operation here. Uh, the protocol is, you know, you walk into the flying club and they have these little masks. <clears throat> Everybody who's inside has to, you know, wear a mask in the flying club wear a mask in the airplane. They've got hand sanitizer everywhere. They got a little thermometer for your head and um, they're going through all those safety protocols. So as soon as everybody gets used to that, it's just flying business as usual. There's tons of students, tons of airplanes out, tons of instructors working. And really the only difference is everyone's wearing these masks. <laughs> so it's, you know, here in California, things are, are picking up. Uh, what are you seeing, Josh? Um, it, it stuff slowed down for a little while. It's starting to pick back up a little bit more. I live about 10 minutes away from the San Marcos Regional Airport, and I don't instruct full time, but I do do a lot of flight reviews, instrument proficiency checks and stuff like that. And for a while, a lot of people were apprehensive about flying with another person. My personal flying didn't necessarily slow down too much because we own our own 172. So we can pretty much just, you know, go solo whenever we want. Um, but I did see a lot of the flight schools, they just straight up closed for a little while. But for the most part, now we're pretty much back in full swing. I live right under the final approach fix. So I'm, I'm hearing airplanes going along like like normal now, pretty much. Okay. What about you, Chris? Uh, things have actually been really busy here. I, I think it's largely situational and geographical based on, uh, you know, how things are running in your state. Uh, for us, I think the challenge is that our tourism industry has all but been shut down because people have to get a test to even come into Alaska. So they're being really careful with that. Uh, that said, I've been really busy. I have a, you know, I've had a commercial and a CFI check right already. Another CFI check right tomorrow, a girl I'm putting through a private um, uh, training right now. So it's actually been really busy, but those are mostly local people that are kind of committed long term. So, um, yeah, very kind of very different because it's going on what's going on on the outside and that we're locked down here in Alaska. But other than that, it's the one of the busiest flying summers I've ever had. I think you, it's very apt. It is, it is definitely situational. Uh, Jason, you look like you wanted to jump in on that. Well, I, I, yeah, I did. I mean, just cause you know, back when the, the quarantine first hit, I was doing all these Instagram live things and I was having interviews with people and I just, Carrying forward some of the stuff I learned, you know, I interviewed an aerosol scientist and a couple doctors and just for anybody that's wondering, uh, without going into all the science behind it, the general consensus is, you know, with the airflow moving through the cabin and when I sit in the right seat, I take the top vent, I point it right across the front of my mouth, I get the bottom vent blowing right at my sunglasses so they don't fog up, but there's like a wall of wind going this way down toward the floor. Mm -hmm. Most of the doctors I talked to said mask or no mask with the air moving the way it is through the cabin, you're probably fine. And certainly if both parties are wearing a cloth mask, doesn't have to be an N95 mask unless you're super high risk, that's fine. You know, So either way, really what they're saying is with the airflow moving, that's gonna be fine. And then when we're at idle power or sitting there, I just take my iPad and 
route the air through the window. So it's, <laughs> I just make sure the air is moving a lot. And, and I think so if anybody's feeling uncomfortable about it, you can look up those interviews I did or whatever and hear from the experts. But it is pretty safe if you take the right steps. You know. I actually watched a lot of your Instagram lives and had a chance to, you know, hear you talk about um, a lot of things that were very interesting to me as I'm sort of a student pilot on paper, if you will. So just sort of going through the course material, waiting uh, for things to change uh, for me. Um, I had a question come into the chat that I want to pass along. And uh, Chris, I'll start with you because you already touched on this in terms of having someone uh, come through with her first solo just a few days ago. Sydney wants to know what advice would you give to young female pilots? We'll go ahead and start with you, Chris. Mm, <laughs> interesting. I, I think first and foremost, there is a lot of support for female pilots. There's the women in aviation group that is fantastic and very supportive. There's also the, uh, the 99s. Um, that's not only like a national group, both of them, but also some very supportive local chapters that you can get together with and get a lot of support there. I know there's a lot of scholarships available to through those organizations. Um, I, there's been actually something going on here in Alaska with uh, with someone that's that's done or said some inappropriate things to women as well. And another thing I'd say is that is rare, um, but it does happen. And absolutely do not stand for any sort of advances like that. And if it does happen, please come forward because I am kind of on a war path here locally to, to help out some local uh, female aviators because of that. Whereas everyone, everyone else I know is absolutely supportive to just get rid of that sort of thing. So that is out there. There is a movement to get rid of it right now. And uh, just know that you have so much support in our community to make sure that doesn't happen. I appreciate your stance on that. And for saying that for, um, you know, women out there who are student pilots in the space. Uh, Josh, what, what do you think? Uh, along the same lines, you know, in terms of finding groups that will support, you know, be able to support female aviators or up and coming female aviators, there's so many of them all over the place. I know here in Central Texas, the 99s are super active. Um, and in terms of, you know, inappropriate advances or inappropriate things being said, or even discouraging things being said, I've, I've heard some of it uh, in the industry amongst my peers uh, as well. And I think we all have a responsibility as aviators to hold each other accountable to basically just be good people. And if, of course, as flight instructors, we are all, we're not only teachers, we're mentors. And that I think that is so, so important. Being, being a flight instructor, that's a huge part of it is being a mentor, being a positive influence. So we've kind of got to hold each other accountable in that regard. Uh, let's go ahead right now and bring it back to Chris. Chris, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, so I, I just want to share a really quick story, an inspiring story from the uh, the student I have right now, Nicole. And actually, she's kind of not my student anymore because we got her through her training. But she came here from Arizona. She drove up here. She's going to be here for a few months. And just to give you an example of how how I, I really appreciate female aviators and how well they do in flight training, she came here super focused. She had her her, uh, her test done. She got her commercial rating on July 26th, or sorry, June 26th. The next day, she got her commercial C plane rating. And then six days after that, she got her CFI, her certified flight instructor. So she has hit it so hard. I'm super proud of her. And, and so, you know, kind of apart from the other stuff that I would mention is just, you know, I, I really celebrate just how, how much we need females in the industry um, and males for that regard. But I, I just really, really appreciate how hard she's worked and that can be you too. So, you know, keep putting the effort in and you can get there. It just takes one step at a time and there are people and, and organizations there to support you. Jason, I, you know, you, at some point it, it's going to be unremarkable. Like, like it won't be a, a female pilot. We'll all just be pilots and we're definitely making progress in, in that regard. Uh, Jason, you were going to say? Um, well, just that, like what Chris said, I think every female aviator that I know has been able to plug into that network, the ones that Chris is talking about, the 99s and all sorts of other stuff. And yeah, there are just awesome resources there. Um, yeah. And other than that, I mean, I've worked with a lot of men, a lot of women. And um, I think that with with the women that are coming through, it might be, you know, there's this part of flight training where you take a moment to figure out you have the right relationship with your instructor. And I think if there's any difference, because I was going to say there's probably nothing different about men or women, except for that, that moment. I think a woman should take 
a little bit of extra care to make sure that that's the right relationship. Maybe it's better for a woman to train with a woman sometimes, or maybe not. It has to be the right guy, somebody that's not doing the stuff that Chris is talking about, but somebody that's really supportive. Um, but getting that right in the beginning, I think is going to be key. Sydney absolutely loved that. Uh, she says, thank you very much for giving us your opinions. So let's talk a little bit about figuring out what works from a teaching style. If you're a student pilot and you don't know the first thing about what you are supposed to look for, what advice would you give to folks so that they make a good decision or how to transition to a different CFI if it's not working out? Josh, why don't we start with you? That's a tricky one. I've, I've ran into a lot of students and pilots who already have their certificate and they're looking for an extra rating or something. And they they feel like they can't make any more advances toward the rating or something. They basically hit a plateau and they don't know why. A learning plateau is something that is very common amongst every, I mean, almost every student is going to run into a plateau of some sort at some point. But it's important to be able to recognize when there's a certain type of plateau that's caused by your relationship with an instructor or how you're clicking with that instructor. And maybe there's some, the, the way they teach something just doesn't really jive with your learning style or something like that. Uh, transitioning to a new flight instructor as a student, that can be really, that can be a very intimidating conversation to start uh, with an instructor because an instructor could easily take that the wrong way. Um, I, when I'm taking somebody through a, a rating or even an endorsement or something like that, I like to have them just fly with another CFI so they can get an idea of what it's like to fly with somebody other than me. Uh, because, you know, maybe there's one little thing that they haven't quite caught on to yet that I teach, but because of the way I say it, it hasn't clicked. And they'll fly with another instructor, see that they do it slightly differently, whatever the case may be, and it clicks. Um, and they may even discover that they like flying with that instructor better. And if that's the case, that's fine. Uh, we're all different, we're all human. And we're all very unique. So you just got to kind of find that right instructor that you click with. And like Jason is saying, there has to be the right relationship there. Um, and it can be a tricky conversation to start. But as CFIs, again, along the lines of being mentors, I think it's also we have a big responsibility to kind of drive that mentality and encourage the student to kind of check their dipstick on if they're happy with flying with me or not. You know, and, and that's why I'll oftentimes suggest, well, hey, here's a friend of mine who's a great instructor. I want you to go fly with them and, you know, go do this topic with them and see how you like it or something like that. You know, I think I think it's important for us to kind of keep an open mind in that regard. I see you nodding, Jason. Yeah, I rely. I mean, I agree pretty much with everything Josh just said. I rely heavily on phase checks, not just for. Um, well, I just think it's it's healthy for everybody. It actually confirms for the student that some of the things that I've been saying are probably true. I also keep my game really sharp because my colleagues will come back to me and say, you know, he did this thing and I'm not sure if that's the right thing, you know? So it really helps me. I mean, I think my students, by the time they go for the check ride, have flown with three or four other CFIs for sure. And the last thing I wanted to say about it was, I think what Josh touched on is we're all pros. I think even though that's a really hard conversation to bring forward, it's not a hard conversation for a CFI. <laughs> so just know that if it's not working for you, if someone came to me and said, hey, Jason, you know, like I've been flying with you now for two weeks and I just don't know if this is the right fit. I think I prefer flying with Mary or whatever. It'd be like, awesome. Like you found your fit. That's great. Let me talk to Mary. I'll transfer your records. I mean, it's like going from one dentist to another. You know, there's nothing personal about it except for the student because you, I mean, well, it is personal, I suppose, but we're not going to get offended in most cases. That's that's what we're trying to say. Right. Chris, I noticed you also nodding and 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 in avid agreement with uh, what we're talking about here. Yeah, I, I I think for me, I I am so invested in the success of of people coming through their dreams as a pilot that if that means that they need to fly with a different instructor and they line up better with them, that's absolutely what I would rather have happen than to drag them along with me and not have it work. Uh, being geographically challenged here in Alaska, I often tell people that may be an hour and a half away that want to drive to me uh, and, and recommend them to a different school because that's a whole part of the process too and, and the fatigue that comes into adding three hours of driving to their lessons. So um, I have no problem sending people to the right fit that is best for them. Just know that if you are seeking an instructor, that that is the most important relationship that you will have. And 
I kind of joke with my CFI students recently in that I, I say that it's really easy to teach someone to fly. It's a skill that's not inherently difficult to pick up. There's certain knowledge that you have to do. There's the check ride that is, you know, it, the answers are there for the check ride. Uh, you know how you have to prepare, but the CFI is largely a motivator and a counselor and a mentor. And, uh, and we help people through those learning plateaus, those times when they are unsure of themselves, that they're actually on the right path to where they need to go. Because what they expect in, in some ways is to do that perfectly smooth landing as we, as we start out learning to land. And what they don't realize is that's what you pick up at the end of your training when you can really feel things out. So, um, you know, being that motivator that just kind of pulls people through um, maybe not even pull, but kind of guide people through, uh, I think is, uh, is something that I really enjoy about instruction. And I would encourage those out there looking for an instructor to find someone that uh, has that same love and altruistic feeling about, uh, about what they want to do for their students. I feel the landing part in my heart because the thought of it makes my palms <laughs> sweaty, and I know I know I'll get I'll get through it with with the right training. Hey, Eli um, is on the chat, just saying. Literally, you are all of Eli's favorite YouTubers. Um, so Eli's pretty uh, pumped to be seeing thanks, all Eli. three of you guys together. Um, <laughs> you know, I want to ask you something about social media because Eli's referencing YouTubers, and realistically. So many people know you through social media as opposed to a direct proximity in your community or at your, your flying school. What has social media done to elevate the aviation game, particularly as it comes to flight training? And Jason, given that you have this long history of teaching and you've seen this um, transition, let's start with you. Um, yeah, I mean, gosh, you know, when you talk about uh, what has it done for aviation YouTube, I feel like there's everything under the sun on YouTube. I mean, sometimes I see videos and I just can't believe what I'm seeing. I can't believe it's out there. Um, but I think I can, I can speak for myself and I can probably speak for the other two guys here. Because of that, it's like, it's really gratifying to put out something that's high quality. And I think for me making videos, um, it's just making me get better and better and more precise and more precise. And, you know, Chris was talking about that Lazy 8 video I released a couple of years ago. And it's like something like that. If I can contribute something like that to the community, maybe I'm offsetting the guy who flew into the clouds laughing with his friends, you know, scud running someday. Right. I'm putting good information out there. Um, and that's and that's really rewarding. So, you know, and, and it keeps my game sharp, too. Like if I ever get something wrong in a video, I'm quick to go in there and make a correction and say, hey, that thing I said wasn't exactly right. But here's the way you want to do it. And just really passionate about bringing quality information to the internet because there's so much garbage out there. Um, I just want that bit there as well. You know, I will come to you last, Josh, just because you really grew up in the social media um, mm -hmm. sphere. I want to talk to you, Chris, about your evolution and all of the, the amazing training uh, videos and things that you've developed along the way. What has social media meant to you? You know, I, I think, uh, again, Jason speaking for me, I'm going to speak for Jason a little bit. Um, one of the things that I've really enjoyed through my process is is I've enjoyed being an active instructor and showing just the regular everyday things that I'm teaching students and the experiences I have. And so I, I film quite a bit when I'm with students, when they're actual students. And I, I think deeply about how I can improve my craft along the way how I could have said things better, how I could say it in a more concise manner, or really a manner that, that hits home better with the student. So um, the, the social media that I have is largely a derivative of the instruction that I get to do, very blessed to get to do here in Alaska. You know, there's a lot of pictures that I have of me as an instructor in the right seat looking out the window and seeing beautiful scenery. There's just these amazing opportunities that I get to not only assist people through their training, but also to, um, to have a wonderful career, to support my family with that career and, and have this, this holistic experience. And so it is really neat to, to be able to assist people through, I guess, at, at a distance through this process and, and help them see some things that I do. Um, but you know, I, I feel like I'm just adding to an already 
mostly quality uh, situation. Speaking of Jason and, and the pioneering that he's done in the industry with uh, the Finer Points podcast and and his uh, his great videos and, and adding my own little twist, you know, and I it's just I don't know I'm so grateful to get to do that and uh, and and just hope that I can keep it up somehow because it's it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> You and me both. I, hear, I hear Jason laugh. Josh, what about from, from your perspective um, as someone who really sort of started in the space and has evolved in the space? It's been an interesting road and I've learned so much, not only, of course, about flying throughout the whole process and, and social media and everything, but I've learned a lot about myself. Uh, I started doing the whole YouTube thing. This is my 10th year. Uh, I started when I was in flight training. And I effectively grew as a pilot through the killing zone in the eyes of the world. And, uh, and it was, that was a really interesting learning experience because it taught me more than I probably ever could have learned using other methods about humility and about calling out your own mistakes and seeing you do stuff wrong, or I say something wrong on camera or while I'm flying or whatever the case may be and realize, wow, okay. I thought that was correct in the plane, but I'm listening to it now and that was totally wrong. That kind of stuff. Um, I haven't, I don't create too much you know, raw training content right now, mainly because I'm just not training people full time. I don't have time at the moment. Uh, but what I do is when I, whenever I do go travel is I film it as best I can. And I, I capture my experiences growing as a pilot. And I talk to, to, uh, you know, whoever's next to me or the cameras, if they're rigged up in the plane, as though a student pilot is sitting next to me. And, uh, and it's, it's a really great way to condition myself to just call out every little thing I do wrong and make sure that I'm, you know, I try to do things by the book and I try to, to make sure that I'm all, I always walk into every situation, uh, regarding flying or even not flying and assume that I can learn something from this situation. And it's, it's, uh, really been a great tool, social media. It's been a fantastic tool to, to kind of beat that into me. And uh, I'm pretty grateful for it. I think the first time I heard this phrase uh, was actually from Chris. Um, and it was that, you know, getting wherever you are in the journey, all of this is just a license to learn the next thing. So all of you have touched on, you know, working to become better in your respective professions and and help people coming up, learning how to fly, become better in what they're chasing. I do have this list of questions, but we're really here for the people in the chat. And Eli followed up with a great question that people really liked in the chat. So I want to make sure to get to it. So I'll scroll back and get right to the exact wording. Okay. Eli is pre-solo, um, about 16 hours into the PPL. At And I do love this because I'm curious. At what point do you suggest to incorporate for flight or iPads into flight training? I've got a whiz wheel and the thing intimidates me. Let's talk about the balance between the two. Josh, <laughs> I'll start with you first, then I'll go to Chris, and then I'll go to Jason. Absolutely. I didn't start using a tablet uh, until I started on my instruments. I went through my whole private using paper charts. Uh, I very much so like teaching that just because I think navigating with a piece of paper is one of the, it's just cool. I really like it. Um, but, you know, if somebody wants to, if, if a student wants to invest in an iPad and have four flight there available for them, that's, that's, to me, I don't necessarily see a problem with it. Expect me to fail it. And, and expect me to make you at some point navigate without it. Uh, and I think it's really, 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 really important to get those fundamentals down. In the real world, I hardly ever take a cross country now without four flight on my lap, you know, an ADSB, and I've got the Garmin 430 and everything. But when it really comes down to it, you need to be able to, to find your, point, your, your way from point A to point B without using those fancy tools and having traffic there. You need to know how to scan for traffic and know how to analyze the weather without having ADSB and everything. So I don't necessarily think there's a point where it's too early to use for flight. Uh, it's definitely at the discretion of the instructor. And I think it's a good thing for the instructor to uh, see it, uh, see appropriate times to fail it and, and kind of go back to basics. So that's, that's the way I see that whole topic. That's awesome. Chris, what do you think? I have several different, I guess, specialties or passions as an instructor. Um, one of them being I, I'm really passionate about the old school tribal knowledge and bringing that back, stick and rudder type flying, attitude type flying. Um, but then there's also this other world I'm quite passionate about, which is technology. And I, I think that they don't always co-mingle the best. Uh, and, and we have to be careful with what we do there. 
that said, um, I actually am a, a fairly big proponent of using four flight fairly early. Uh, the, the way I see it is that this is what the student is going to use when they leave my nest. So when they become a private pilot, they need to know how to use these tools and use them well. One of the issues that we've had over the years from the very beginning days of knowing how to get from where you are to your grandpa's farm in an airplane is year after year, we keep adding more and more information on the pilots that they need to know. And so largely what ForeFlight becomes is an information gathering tool, something that we can stay organized with so that we can focus on the aeronautical decision-making, the things that go into uh, to really making safe decisions. Of course, it helps and it's integrated in that a little bit, but um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of actually having it along the way. I think pre-solo, you know, I, I really want people focusing on flying the airplane before solo. I really don't even want to talk about sectional charts. I don't even want to talk about paper charts at all. So even if I did believe in, in only those, I would be talking only about flying the airplane at this point pretty much. But definitely after solo, we're going to start getting in the cross countries and I want them to start learning those tools so that again, when they leave my nest, they, uh, they know how to use them and use them well and make safe decisions because of it. Lots of discussion in the chat on this one. Jason, what do you think? Yeah, <laughs> um, I, you know, I have pretty, pretty strong opinions about this. It's funny having done this for so long. I'm, you know, I've been doing this for about 20 years. And I think like 20% of the stuff I know, I've just had to forget because it's irrelevant. But there is this line, like, so for me with ForeFlight, the thing is, just like Chris said, this is the tool you're going to use. So we have to learn how to use it. But let's just put that on the shelf for a second, because there's definitely check rides where I've seen examiners walk in and say, give me your flight plan. The student hands them the four flight flight plan and the examiner says, well, how did they get this fuel number? And the student just turns white and says, well, I put it in there and it did the calculation. And I don't know, you know, so for me, it's it's all about learning what four flights doing for you. Um, like an analogy is, you know, like I, I was on an instrument lesson this morning and I feel like we're really lucky here in the Bay Area. We get all that marine layer fog. We have great, great instrument training. And I'm teaching this student, the first five lessons are on a six pack with old needles and we fully intend to move to the G1000. Um, so it's that kind of thing. I want him to know what the G1000 is doing for him. So to give you some real specifics, for me, it's the third cross country on the, uh, in a private. So like Chris said, we'll do up to solo essentially with the instruments covered and a marker in my hand, something like this, where we're drawing on the window and doing attitude flying. And then when we move into the cross country phase, I want to do the first two cross countries on paper and it's laborious and it takes two and a half hours and you have to use that whiz wheel. But the notice that I want you to have is when you go do it on four flight, you know, a month later, ask yourself, which flight did I know more about? Did I know more about the flight that I planned on paper? Or did I know more about the flight that I flew in four flight? And what that'll do is it'll get you looking at four flight in a different way because four flight certainly has all the data. You just have to know what it's doing for you, which corners it's cutting, what it's taking out of the equation for you. And I think if you do the first two cross countries on paper, then you really know what four flight's doing. And you can dive into that truth that Chris said is like, this is the tool they're going to be using. And four flight's so powerful that certainly with the instrument rating, you're, I mean, I would say you have to use it. Like, I'm not going to let you go through the instrument rating in today's world using paper. It's like, you're leaving way too much. No out. way. You know, so yeah. it's a, it's a really delicate balance, you know. Chris, you wanted to contribute to that. Yeah, you know, I I, I definitely bring out the paper. I, I only do one flight myself. Um, so I, I kind of compare it to film versus digital cameras. So I, I shoot photos a little bit. I used to shoot film. Um, I, you know, kind of grew up through the digital age to see how that happened. But I still know what ISO means, what f-stop means, what shutter speed means, all of those things that they're still using in digital cameras today that they use in film cameras before. So I, I think that's largely what Jason is talking about is what is what is ForeFlight actually doing behind the scenes to get those numbers? And that is a very important um, conversation to have and exercise to do with the old paper chart and the whiz wheel to see you know, that wind line and where it's coming from and, and how you're actually getting these headings and the variation and how everything comes together um, actually becomes 
something that I want to instill a sense of curiosity and, and fascination in my students, that that is where everything's coming from. And that even in today's world, we may be seeing it on a screen, but we are still deriving it from those old school methods. And, uh, and so they know what it is. You know, they, they've got to answer those things on the written test, whether they actually knew what they were talking about or not, or just memorized it. I want them to know where that stuff is coming from. Yeah. We have and a I really think, good question. You know, from, to, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say to add on to what Chris said, I think it'll make four flight more powerful for you. Mm -hmm. Like if you know those yep. things that Chris is talking about, four flight then will really unfold into its full capability. So you can think about it like that. Right. Yep. Agree. We have, we have a question coming in from Caleb on the chat. Caleb, I'm getting to it in just a second, but I want to go back to something that Jason mentioned earlier. And I, I may have the percentage wrong because it was running through my mind, but you said, I think 20% of what you learned isn't relevant. And it's a great question to ask what things happen in the real world that are not done enough in training. We'll start with you, Jason. Um, God, one of my biggest things is, is well, just overbanking, like, you know, the fact that when an air, like the lazy eight, really, <laughs> I'm going to get at the lazy eight should be a private pilot. <laughs> um, this is something that happens all the time. Like anytime you bank an airplane and you slow down, the airplane has a tendency to overbank. And like right now in the private certificate, we really only teach overbanking tendency in steep turns. But the reality is if I bank only two degrees and I pull, the airplane is going to overbank. It will continue to bank. And this is something that we leave out really of private training as a, as a very specific concept. And the lazy eight is really the only maneuver that teaches it. So for that reason, I show my private pilots lazy eights. That's the first thing that comes to mind, like for real world stuff, you know. Okay, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, Josh, do you have you something in, in your mind? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I certainly do. Uh, the, you know, the recent series that I did about... Uh, fatal accidents in general aviation and kind of addressing that fatal accident rate. I think one thing that should be addressed more is, uh, you know, we practice stalls, power on, power off, and, you know, the departure and, and approach stalls. Uh, but I don't think a lot of people have seen or had have, have had demonstrated to them what it feels like and what it looks like for an airplane that's about to stall in an uncoordinated state. Um, and I think there could be a lot more awareness in this regard because we're seeing so many fatal accidents in general aviation happening on base to final, or you know, perhaps just after departure, the engine fails and the airplane gets too slow and the airplane stalls in an uncoordinated fashion, a wing drops, and then that usually leads to a fatal, fatal scenario. So I think something that we should pay a lot more attention to in private pilot training is kind of a, a good variety of stalls, not necessarily just the straight and level departure stall or the straight, or, or not necessarily the straight ahead departure stall or a straight ahead approach stall, but let's practice, you know, some more turning stalls and pay attention to speed awareness in the pattern and not getting the airplane too slow. But if you do get the airplane too slow, these are the clues that something's about to happen and this is what you can do to fix it. Uh, I think that is, is certainly a neglected area in private pilot training. Chris, let's go over to you. First off, I just have to say that Jason is the real MVP, okay? He has a sectional chart behind him. He had the marker right in hand, <laughs> and then he pulls out an I'm airplane a as an example. <laughs> He's the perfect instructor, okay? So uh, <laughs> oh, so something that I so thought funny. recently was that we need to be more like three-year-olds. I have a three-year-old boy. He's very curious. And I think as pilots, we need to ask why, especially of our instructors, we need to ask why a lot more. Why am I practicing these stalls? Why am I doing a power on stall? Why am I doing a power off stall? I like to show, for example, uh, like with uh, Jason and even, even you, Josh, is I like to show accelerated stalls in the private pilot level because I want them to understand the energy state of the airplane and what is exactly happening with the wing. Uh, I like to do power off 180s, which is a, a simulated engine out uh, drift down to a landing so that they can understand how much energy, depending on the airplane, if it's a if it's a, a Piper Arrow, it's a brick. If it's a 172, it's a paper airplane. But how much energy the airplane actually has to drift down and land. So those are things I'm really passionate about: is connecting why we are asked to do certain maneuvers for the check ride, prove those, but why those are applicable in the real world. A lot of it comes back to the traffic pattern. Um, 
but really I, I'm continually, continually in my own mind trying to connect why we are we doing these things? Are we just doing them because it's always been in the regulations and because it's always been in the check ride, or is there an actual purpose to doing these things? And I think that's largely where Jason was going with it too, is these things we don't hear enough about, like overbanking tendency and adverse yaw and left turning tendencies and what we need to do as a result. Again, me being passionate about uh, stick and rudder flying, I want to know why we're doing those things and what, what they're coming back to. And then later on, when we get to more of the correlative type of thoughts as pilots, how do we safely um, go through our day to day? How do we avoid certain situations that are going to get us in, in, in tricky spots? Um, uh, you know, to a point where we're going to need to pull the wing and, and do something weird. And how would we do that if we actually had to? So that's kind of my soapbox thing really quick. But just a reminder for those of you that are in flight training, be like a three-year-old. Keep asking why all the time. <laughs> You'll get great answers. Awesome. Hey, Steph, there was yeah. one thing too that I forgot to mention. This is a funny one and it's not anything near as powerful as what Chris and Josh were just talking about. But fueling, I can't believe how often I get a student. I work at a class Delta airport where we have a truck that comes. I would say like every student I have at the end of training says, how do I use a fuel island? <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. We've never actually fueled up at a fuel island. So let's make a trip over to a non-towered airport and pull the airplane out, right? So whichever one you're used to, if you've never gone to an FBO and ordered fuel from a truck, you should go do that. And if you've never used a fuel island, you should go do that. Two simple things. I need you guys. I need you to know. I actually wrote down everything you just said uh, to make a note, so that when I actually, She's I'm not even kidding. And I am learning, and I am paying lesson. attention. <laughs> <laughs> no, like the best lesson. Look at this panel, you guys. Um, this was the question that I was referencing earlier from Caleb. Um, Caleb wants to know what your opinions are about students uh, recording their first solos. And I, I'm trying to decide. I think, Josh, I'll start with you and then I'll work my way to Chris and then to Jason. Josh, what do you think about students recording their first solos? I would feel really hypocritical if I said don't do it <laughs> because I, <often laughs> um, I think yeah. it, the instructor should certainly uh, use their expertise to kind of, you know, feel out the situation. And it's all about not being distracted by the cameras. And, I, and if, if you are going to, if you, if you have to record your first solo or you feel super compelled to uh, consult your instructor, really get your instructor's uh, opinion on how that can be done in a way that's not going to distract uh, distract the, the student while they're in the middle of their solo. For example, if the camera, the suction couplets go to the window and it falls to the floor, uh, that camera should ideally be back behind you, you know, shooting over your shoulder or something. So if it falls, you don't even know. You, you don't want to, you don't want to just get distracted by it. You don't want anything to, to do with it, especially on a first solo. I am very much so of the mentality. I usually run about six or seven cameras in the plane with an audio recorder. And I start all of them before I even get in and turn on the master switch. And I don't touch the cameras until I land. I have very big SD cards and batteries, but it's worth it to me because I can turn them on and forget. And I can, I can be the pilot that I need to be on that flight, or I can be the instructor that I need to be. So if you're going to record your first solo, it's got to be done in such a way that, that the student is not even going to know it's there. And in my opinion, that's the only way that it can safely be done. And I think that's where we as instructors, we don't even really need to know much about video or anything like that, but we do know a lot about cockpit safety and managing risks in the cockpit. And I think we can use that expertise to kind of step in and say something if we see something that's going to potentially be unsafe. And, and if that's something that's going to happen, we can, uh, we can certainly uh, give our opinions on that and make sure it's going to be safe. Chris, what are your thoughts? I, I think it's largely situational. I want to make sure that my particular student yeah. that I'm working with isn't the type to be distracted by that or be intimidated by it. If I feel like they can push it out of their mind, then it's something that I would invite them to do. Um, and I actually ran cameras on this uh, this young lady that I just soloed a, a couple, like a week ago. Um, she's 18. I did her discovery flight at 16. And I've just got to show this, hopefully on the camera, it shows up well, but I just got to show what recording your solo can be like if you go through all the safety measures. So let me see if I can show this. This is her <laughs> after her second takeoff. And she was that says so it all. excited. Yeah, it, it's just pure gold. And so yeah. um, 
you know, if you can put it out of mind, you know, you get the safety, of course, is always number one. If you can get that set up, then, you know, that is, that's so special. Like the, you'll never get that again. Right. Yeah. I think that if you're going to do it, you should have, you should be doing it the whole time, right? Like it's, you just, you shouldn't introduce that at the solo. And if you've been running oh, cameras right. with your CFI and you feel comfortable, you know, it's just, and maybe the other thing is like, you don't have to be, you know, Josh has got a channel, so he's running six cameras, but you know, you can just put one little overhead here with audio and it's out of sight, out of mind, get it rolling. And I think as long as you've been doing that, you know, that, that that's reasonable. And what Josh said earlier about learning is really important. I mean, I experienced that all the time where I take the footage from my lessons, I go home and I think, well, no wonder he did that. I said the wrong thing, you know, but I didn't know I said the wrong thing until I watched myself do it on the camera. Um, that happens a lot mm -hmm. more than I would like to admit. <laughs> so, you know, you can learn a lot. Just don't throw it in there at the last minute. Right. It's a bit like the reality TV model where they put the cameras in the houses and then eventually people just forget. And they and that's to your point about introducing that early, if that's something you're going to do. A lot of people in the chat are talking about what they've learned as they've watched people go through these flights and either make mistakes and, and that there is a teachable moment in there if it is done um, correctly. I want to talk about what is one of the most common issues or challenges that student pilots face? Chris, let's start with you on this one. Oof, I, I, I'm really big on the soft skills as an instructor. So I, I just think that I really want to monitor how people are feeling about their training, um, if they're discouraged, how they're progressing, if they're slowing down, if they're, uh, if they're not wanting to train as much, those sorts of things. But Really, I just I just want to make sure that people understand when I'm training them that a they get a, like a good debrief and an honest debrief of what they're doing correctly or, or rather incorrectly. Like just be honest about the stuff they're doing. You know, you don't have to be a jerk, but let's just be honest about the things we need to fix and let's keep it unemotional and just uh, keep plugging through things. And then also I like to praise people when, when it's uh, appropriate and let them know that they're doing great and they're on track uh, with this particular young woman I'm working with. She, she has a tendency to be a little bit self-defeating and a little bit down on herself. And so I'm constantly reminding her that was fantastic. You, that like, that was a great landing. I'm the type of instructor. If I, if I'm quiet, the whole lap, for example, right before a solo, if I'm quiet, the whole lap, and you land and you finish that landing well, I am going to clap and cheer after we've landed. I'm going to be so excited for you. So I, I, I really try to focus on those sorts of things. And, uh, and I think that helps people. They just need to know where they're at because in their own mind, they think that they're the worst pilot ever most of the time. Or the best pilot ever. That's probably the scarier thing. I was they say, really yeah, good. They're, they're not as good as they should. Yeah. I actually, I, I need you. Uh, I love that idea of kind of helping to cheerlead and build confidence so that um, I can then learn and get out of my own head. Uh, Josh, what are your thoughts on this? And then Jason, I'll round it out with you. Yeah, as soon as you asked that question, the, the first word that was like I it wanted to come out of my mouth was confidence. Uh, it's, confidence is such an important thing to not, it, not only do we need to make sure that the student has enough confidence to be able to effectively go through the training, we also want to kind of, help throttle it and monitor it and make sure that they don't get too much of it. Because I, like, like I said, I kind of grew up through the killing zone in flying while I was posting on YouTube. And I got to kind of watch myself. I go through this period of not too much confidence. And then I went through the whole spike of confidence with very little skill and then kind of came back down and evened out. So as an instructor, I think it's important for us to uh, really monitor that and make sure that we're wording things in such a way that that make the student feel encouraged and keep letting them know that, hey, you're, you know, you're doing great. These are the challenges that I see that you're facing. And, you know, this these are the things that we want to work on next. And here's the things that we need to debrief on that flight. These are the things you did great. And we can kind of, you know, regulate it, what what we're talking about and how and, and just kind of check their confidence, check the dipstick, you know, and, and make sure that that they're doing all right in terms of not too much and, and not too little. Too little can be very bad because it could encourage them to, to stop flying. They could easily just back out of it and say, well, I'm not good enough for this. Too much confidence can get them killed. <laughs> you know, so I, th I think right. it's uh, 
that's a big, big challenge that just about every single pilot goes through at some point, whether it's too much confidence, too little confidence. Uh, a lot of pilots go through both. And, uh, and that's certainly something that I think we have a huge responsibility in helping regulate. I want to bring Jason in and then Chris, I see you want to contribute to that as well. Jason, what are your thoughts? Yep. Um, I don't know. Three, three little things jump to mind. I think the first one for sure is not appreciating how much work has to happen outside the lesson. By far, that's the most common error. I feel like people get into flying and they think about it like it's a horseback riding lesson. Like you go there, you do the lesson, you go home and you have a beer and you talk about it with your wife or whatever. It's really much more like a college class. You go there to get the work you're going to need to take home with you. And it's about a three to one ratio, three hours for every hour in the airplane of studying and preparation. Um, I think people would be blown away. Um, I know I would have been. My instructor told me this, and I didn't really believe it until I was a teacher, honestly. And so I didn't really plug it in until I went for my ATP. And uh, now being on the other side of the table, that's huge. Um, the other one, I think, is too tight a grip on the yoke. There's so many problems downstream from using trim to over controlling to everything. So if you're that person, just do this. You know, try to fly with these two fingers and, and thread something through the other. Yeah, thread that like that, Steph, right? There you go. And you can't squeeze too hard. Right, you'll just use two fingers. That's a huge one. There's so many problems downstream if you do that, right? And I think the last one is like to, I think it was Chris's point. You just, Chris, you were talking about somebody being um, like, you know, praising people and there's definitely a balance, right? So I wanna be a good coach. I wanna tell you when you're doing great, but don't fight me when I'm telling you you're doing bad. Like there's so much ego that kicks in. So if I have like, cause everybody, like Chris said, you know, people feel like it's the, they're the worst pilot ever, right? And we're not gonna talk about the people who think they're the best pilot. But everyone thinks they're the worst one ever. Um, don't defend that. Like if I say, hey, that landing was off center. Well, yeah, but I had this thing going on. That's just a waste of time. <laughs> like I know what was going on. I'm telling you. So the students that I've worked with, like my partner, Todd, who have none of that, they just move through so fast. Basically I say it, he says, okay changes it. I say it, he says, okay, and changes it, right? That's the kind of attitude you want to try to have. And if there's any issues you don't agree with and you're not sure about, take it up in the debriefing and have a real talk about it. But, you know, don't argue in the plane. It's a waste of everybody's time. Right. Chris, you had something else you wanted to toss in there. Yeah, it kind of goes back to what we originally talked about with finding a, a really good quality flight instructor, because I think all of this comes down to an intense honesty that people may not be used to in their normal everyday relationships. That is that if I give you praise, I'm being honest. If I give you, um, if I give you some feedback, I'm being honest. They know the praise is real when it's real because they know I'm an honest person. They know that the feedback is real because they know I'm an honest person. It's not just because I'm a jerk. I'm not saying bad things all the time, which I tend to definitely lean on the side of saying positive things. But uh, yeah, it, it's all about that honesty. And if your student can understand that in this particular relationship that they have, you know, professionally with, uh, with the student instructor relationship, then that's just real talk. Like Jason talked about, that's, that's real talk. That's a real debrief. And we don't have to be emotional about it. We're just plugging away. We're improving our skills day after day. And eventually we'll get to this place where, hey, I, as an instructor, I've been the conduit to you getting to this solo or that uh, cross country solo or a commercial or a CFI, because I've been there before. I've seen what it takes and I've seen where you are along the way. So, um, you know, th th I don't know. It's just such a beautiful thing when it's done right, when, when it's gotten right. So again, going back to what we talked about earlier, make sure that you do find the right instructor and, uh, and, and foster that relationship and really, really dig in your heels as a student as well. And in a good way and, you know, be honest and be upfront and act like a three-year-old and ask the why questions and, uh, and take that feedback, but also take that positive feedback too. Cause right. if we praise you, it means it's real because we're, we're also yeah. telling you it's not right. And that's real too. So that's my soapbox. Um, yeah. It's good. It's a fantastic soapbox. I, I, and and I, I promise you, I'm like a sponge right now. Uh, there's a lot of folks in the <laughs> chat who either have a lot of experience or they are going through the process of trying to get to their, their PPL or in some cases, as we've talked about that first solo. What is a tip for people to save money through this process? Because it is one of the big impediments. Uh, Josh, do you have any thoughts on this? And then um, I'll go, I think I'll go to Jason and Chris in that order. Yeah, absolutely. Do as much of your ground school 
before you dive in and start as possible. Um, whenever people ask me, you know, I, I have almost no money to work with right now, or they say they're too young to get into flying or, or whatever the case may be, they say, how can I, what can I do right now to at least get myself stepping in the right direction? And the first thing I do is I send them links to the airplane flying handbook and the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge. Those are free documents from the FAA that have so much information in them. You can download the PDF and read through them or buy, a, you know, buy the hard copy online. Um, that's what I would suggest to anyone out there. If, if you want to just start for dirt, dirt cheap, uh, get a hold of those free FAA documents. They're, they're full of such great information that a lot of people underestimate. Uh, and then if you want to take it a step further, sign up for an online ground school. And you can start going through that before you even start going through the flying curriculum and really start spending money. That way, you have that kind of bank and, and foundation of knowledge. And when you start in the airplane, and you start spending money. When that Hobbs meter starts ticking, you've got that foundation of knowledge that you can start applying stuff to and you can start correlating all this knowledge and stuff's just going to start happening quick. And you'll be able to start basically advancing quicker because you... You've heard these terms before. You've heard these concepts before. I think it's really beneficial to do that. They call it the Hobbs meter, and it sounds so pleasant, and it serves a very good, uh, important purpose. But when you said that, I just went, "Oh yeah, there goes there goes the money." Uh, let's mm -hmm. talk to Jason. Jason, <laughs> yeah. let's get your thoughts. Um, you know, like where I see people wasting money, I don't think it's so much the ground school as it is like what I said before, not preparing. And if you think of just one example, like the run up, okay, like the airplane, I don't know what people are paying anywhere else. So I'm here in the Bay Area. <laughs> people are paying like $170 an hour for, for like a 172, right? And then they're paying me on top of it. And we get out there to the run up area. And sometimes I kind of see them go like, okay, um, wait a minute, like, where is it? And the Hobbs is going and my time is going. And I see like we could have just saved $75 right there if you would have looked at that before we started the engine, right? And just the, touched the switches and just figured out what are you going to do in the run up and what are the magnetos? And even if you're paying your instructor to sit there in the airplane with you, you're not paying the Hobbs time. So, you know, I, I don't have to belabor the point, but just, you know, putting yourself in front of even a, a, like those things you get from sporties, which are like pictures of the cockpit and, and the POH in your hand. And just running through procedures and identifying switches and things like that will save you thousands of dollars. And I'm not even kidding. <laughs> thousands of I see, uh, Josh, you, you want to <laughs> jump in really quick. And then, Chris, I promise we're coming to you because all of you guys are nodding in go agreement. Ahead. Josh, go ahead. Yep. <laughs> no, I was just going to add on to what Jason was saying there. I always say that the, the airplane is a learning tool. It's not necessarily a classroom. So if you want to really learn the stuff and really drill into, you know, what these switches are, what are the mags, you know, this checklist, that checklist, it's it, it's great to just chair fly it beforehand or look at the checklist and touch things just like Jason said and learn that yeah. flow so that when you do execute the checklist in the airplane, it's easy and it goes by like that. So I like to say that it's not, it's a learning tool. It's not necessarily a classroom. So yeah, do that stuff when the clock's not running. Chris, go ahead, jump in on this. Yeah, I, I knew that when you asked this, that these guys would both nail it. Um, you know, from Josh's <laughs> perspective, I, I totally agree in that doing a ground school first or or at least very, very soon in the beginning is is going to give you this knowledge base in which to pull things from. And I'm talking even vocabulary. If you haven't heard certain words in aviation before, the way we phrase those words, the way we say certain things, then you're just going to be confused and you hear that in the airplane for the first time. And you're trying to think about what you need to do with the flight controls when you've heard that word for the first time and suddenly like we're stopped. We don't know where to go now. Um, and then also, I, I, you know, again, because you had uh, asked this question, I heard what Jason had said before, the three to one ratio with with knowledge and time uh, in the airplane, which is super true. Like without fail, this is the number one thing that students struggle with. And if you are also looking to do this all on a budget, Believe it or not, it is under your control. You have tons of control in how much you study this. So let's not only talk about you know the PHAC and the, the airplane flying handbook that Josh mentioned or a ground school like I offer and Jason offer, uh, but also just the fact that you can go to YouTube and see videos on how to do certain things, see other people go through these things. There's so much you can do outside the airplane Learning to fly an airplane is actually pretty easy, especially if you have a good instructor. 
it's the knowledge and like shaping your life and, and learning something holistically for the first time that I think is what a lot of people go through when they learn to fly. You, they may have skated through elementary and, and middle school and high school, you know, and, and not been challenged too much, but gosh, everyone's on the same playing field when you come into to flight training and you've got to figure out how best you learn. For me, I was that way. I, I did okay through school. I was never super passionate about it. Man, as soon as aviation happened to me, the light bulb went on. I was the dude that would read a book for the first time and and uh, go through all those written test questions. So connect the passion that you have for this flying thing with the knowledge and just know that that knowledge is like the gateway to you eventually being, you know, 5,000 feet at sunset with the mountains behind it and the air is perfectly still and you don't have to fly the airplane with your hands. You can just like fly it with a little bit of rudder. And that is what connects you to those moments. So just know that it's all about knowledge, which Jason and Josh yeah. just articulated. Yeah. One other thing, Steph, is that okay? Um, Absolutely. We have about uh, three is, minutes left. I, mean, I was going to say using your CFI properly. Both these guys are talking about doing ground school. And that just one little thing to add on that, if you're doing ground school or even in that three to one ratio, have like a spiral notebook. And if you come across a word spoiler, you don't understand what it does, you know, kind of what it is, just write it down. I'm going to bring that question to my CFI. So you're not going to save money hiring a CFI that's $20 an hour cheaper than the next person. You're going to save money by doing this diligent work and using the tools properly, sitting in the airplane, practicing when the engine's not running, coming into your CFI with a list of questions from the studying you did. That's how you save money. The list of questions makes yep. me so happy. <laughs> Ditto. Yeah, <right>. Questions. <laughs> yeah. Hang on, let me write that down. Uh, I will be <laughs> remiss because it has come up in the chat over and over again. Uh, Jason, very quickly, everyone having a heart attack over what it costs to fly down in the Bay Area. Um, Josh, a lot of people loving the beautiful imagery and the filmmaking qualities that you uh, bring to the game. And Chris, you got to close this out for me here with a clear. I, these guys are going to flay me if oh, I don't no. deliver. Can you give me a clear? Oh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> It's Josh's <laughs> fault. It's all his fault. Okay. <laughs> Clear! <laughs> <laughs> and with that, everyone, we so appreciate you here at EAA Spirit of Aviation Week. Thank you for being a big part of our EAA Together coverage. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you, Steph. Uh, thanks, Steph. Thank you all. Thanks, thank you, guys. Thanks, EAA. See you guys later. Have a great day, everyone.